In many churches across the United States, pastors are expected to preach an annual stewardship message, asking the faithful to dig deeper into their pockets to give more money to the church. In the past, whenever I announced the date for Stewardship Sunday, attendance in the church would be low that day. So I stopped announcing when I'd give that stewardship message. It's been a while since I gave such a message, but today it's time for us to talk about stewardship. But I'm not going to speak about money. Because God did not call you here so that he could separate you from your money. God called you here for something far more important, far more eternal, far more valuable. God called you here because he's interested in your soul, not in your wallet. You and I have only one soul. And it cannot be divided. So God is not interested in a tithe, say, 10% of your soul. God's interested in 100% of your soul. God does not work at fractions. When it comes to your soul, God is in for 100% of your soul or nothing. So valuable is your soul to God that God has never stopped working for the soul of every person ever born. The more I dig into the Bible, it seems more evident to me that God is singularly focused. He created the world and humanity in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. But since that day of rest, God has worked continually and with a singular focus to preserve and then to save the soul of everyone who ever was born. God works tirelessly for our souls because only he and he alone can save our souls. We cannot. God works without rest for our souls out of love, the love of a father for his children because he sees, he knows. His children are in danger. God knows that we are in grave danger of harming our souls. When it comes to our souls, you and I are like toddlers with a sharp knife running throughout the house, waiting to fall upon the blade or to stick the blade in the next available electrical wall socket. Do you know that? Do you believe that? It's true. God, our Father, has worked with that singular focus of keeping our souls safe. To those who would listen to him, God has removed them from danger and brought them into the safety of his hand. But we are very much like toddlers. Sometimes the more you chase a toddler to, remo to remove them from harm, the faster they run away, laughing and screeching, thinking you're playing with them. The state of your soul, the state of my soul, is not a joke. And God's not interested in playing a game when it comes to our souls. There should be nothing more serious to you or anyone else in the world than the state of their soul. And so we must be good stewards of our soul. The state of your soul is central to my stewardship message to you today. I want us to explore stewardship through the words of the Apostle Peter in his first letter. Peter was, of course, a disciple of Jesus. And he was one of two of Jesus' disciples who were subject to great scrutiny in the arrest of Jesus and immediately thereafter. The other disciple was, of course, Judas Iscariot. Now, when you look at Peter and Judas, there are some remarkable, truly remarkable similarities between the two men and one remarkable difference. How were Peter and Judas remarkably similar? Well, here are their similarities. They were disciples of Jesus. 
They learned from Jesus. They both saw Jesus perform countless miracles and healings. They received power from Jesus. With that power, each man healed others and drove out evil and demonic spirits from people across Galilee. They both participated in the Lord's Supper, receiving bread as the body of Jesus and wine as the blood of Jesus. They both struggled with human behaviors. Peter struggled with pride and Judas with greed. Jesus predicted that both men would fail him. Judas betrayed Jesus into the hands of those seeking to arrest him. And Peter cursed and swore an oath that he knew, that he never knew, when I never met Jesus. Both men were sorry they betrayed and denied Jesus. But one thing separated Peter from Judas. Judas was sorry. He was sorry for his actions. And he stopped caring about his physical life. And he stopped caring about his soul. Judas gave up all sense of stewardship as he ended his physical life. And he gave his soul away to be condemned. Peter was sorry for his denial of Jesus. And Peter stopped caring about his physical life as well. But Peter continued to care about his soul. And that's the key difference between Peter and Judas. For the sake of his whole soul, P Peter repented and he received the forgiveness offered by Jesus. And he was restored into fellowship with Jesus. And he entered eternity with a clean slate. Peter was a good steward of his soul. It was this Peter, this good steward of his soul, who wrote, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, Arm yourselves, so with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Let's look at what Peter started out with. First, Peter said Christ suffered in his body. Christ, Jesus, the man Peter followed, who he denied and then repented to, that Jesus suffered bodily. Peter is being mild with his language here when he spoke of Christ's suffering. Jesus, God among us, allowed his body to be savagely beaten, nailed to the cross, and then allowed his body to die to meet God, the Father's singular plan, singular focus, to save the souls of mankind, including Peter, the repentant denier. Peter said that he accepted Christ, the man who died for him and rose again from the dead to prove he was God. Peter was done with sin when he did that. And all life became about his soul. In that moment of clarity, that moment of awe of God, Peter was transformed and Peter willingly gave up his desire of pride and his sinful behavior and instead took seriously God's singular focus to save souls. Peter said, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil desire, evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. What is the will of God? Jesus said, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looked at the Son, Jesus Christ, and believes in him, Jesus, should have eternal life. And that I, Jesus, will raise them up on the last day. Jesus also said, in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. God's will, in Jesus' words, is singularly focused on saving your soul. On saving my soul. Peter understood. He had received salvation for his soul. And so... Peter's singular focus became sharing the good news of Jesus as Savior. 
Peter, a steward of his soul, also became a steward of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. So Peter followed Jesus' example of doing what he saw the Father do in bringing salvation of souls. And Peter became a steward of the gospel of Jesus. And so Peter wrote to his readers, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. And what was that? Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They, the pagans, are surprised that you, you Christians, don't join them in their darkness, their wild living. And so they heap abuse on you. They'll have to give an account to him who is already, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. So that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God, in regard to the Spirit. Peter was saying, you who believe in Christ, you've stopped sinning in the body. And now you must live according to God's plan in the Spirit. This is the gospel given to us through Christ. He's saying, cherish it. Preserve it. Share it. And why must Peter's listeners cherish and preserve and share the gospel? Because doing so is what a good steward does to fulfill the word of God that not that none, no one be lost, meaning no one's soul shall be lost because they didn't hear the word of God. Now Peter recognized that the way he received the gospel and came fully to embrace it was not in a classroom or through a piece of paper or through some other impersonal means. Instead, Peter received the gospel and was sustained in the commitment to the gospel through the experience with a community of believers. First, of course, Peter received the gospel through the person of Jesus and then later sustained in the community of disciples and apostles. Understanding these facts, Peter said, to his listeners that they must do two things as part of their stewardship of the gospel. First, they must find and become part of a group of believers. And second, they must contribute part of their physical energy to sustaining that group of believers so that no one tired needlessly as a steward of the gospel. Peter wrote, the end of all things is near. There isn't much time. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. As part of that faith community, Peter's saying your first action, your first action should be to pray for one another. Pray for one another. Prayer, that talking to God regularly, daily, it helps our minds keep focused on God's will. It helps us to keep focused on the circumstances of another. Knowing somebody's praying for you is such a huge source of encouragement. So pray for one another. Peter then said, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Nothing changes a person's life like knowing that someone acted on their behalf in love. Loving someone makes the presence of the invisible God visible. Love one another. To pray and to love, Peter continued to add to that, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality is that sharing of what you have with others, but you do it without the expectation, without the requirement that the other return the favor, or even say thank you. I think that's where the without grumbling part comes in. Hospitality without grumbling helps us to remain humble. To prayer, to love, 
and to hospitality, Peter added, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in all its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Christ Jesus. Peter's saying, use your gifts and serve. Speak, help, and encourage others. Are the believers that they do not needlessly tire in living in these sometimes confusing and depleting world. Make the existence of believers a, a joyful one and one that is not lonely. Then Peter said something hard. Peter said, take those prayers, take that love, take that hospitality, take all of that service that you do for others and give the glory to God. Give to God all the credit for anything for everything that you do. Why should you do that? Because Jesus said, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. Giving the glory to God. In doing so, we show that the strength of our efforts comes from God. And that we do these things as for others as an expression of the joy, of the peace that we have within us. Because God has saved our souls. What then do we do with what Peter said here? Well, I think there's three things for us to do. First, be a good, be, be a good steward to your soul. Accept without reservation without any hesitation, the salvation offered to you by Christ. You know, you can't genuinely help someone unless you first let your soul rest in the palm of God's hand. And so this is something we don't want to guess about. It's something we don't want to wonder, am I saved? Make it sure. Don't wait for a more convenient time to become a good steward. Peter said to his listeners, the end of all things is near. That statement is always true when applied to our lives. We don't know when our physical life would end. So don't wait. Don't wait to accept Christ. It's a big mistake. Second, be a good steward of that good news of the gospel message. That God through Jesus saved your soul and that your life, regardless of how many years it may be, has been changed to be eternally with God. And being a good steward of the gospel, be willing to share with others what you have done and why you did that. Third, be a good steward of the talents and gifts that you've received to strengthen and enrich the lives of other believers. Help each other. Help each other with the common burdens of life by praying, loving, suffering, offering hospitality, serving. Don't make your Christian life about coming to church for one hour a week and then living as though the people in this room are all on their own. Make the common burdens of their life part of your own. To me, the stewardship message should never, ever be about money. The stewardship message should be about God and what he's done for us. The stewardship message should be about the salvation of our souls and being good stewards of that good news by sharing our joy with others. The stewardship message should be about us using our talents to serve and to love others, to make our daily burdens bearable. 
If we could just be good stewards of our souls, if we could just be good stewards of the gospel message and be good stewards of providing care to other believers, if we could just do those three things, then our finances will be fine. And they will remain appropriately the least of our concerns. Amen. And amen.